good evening and welcome to Bethel Baptist Church for our midweek service. If you're able, please stand and join me tonight as we sing Hymn 184. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hymn 184. <laughs> to be a blessing uh, to you. This is our normal midweek prayer service. We've got Brother Jeff Demarest uh, with us tonight, our missionary to South Africa, so we want to give him as much time as possible, but uh, in that, I'm getting a little bit of echo up here, Brother Rick. Maybe the monitors are a little bit too loud, I think. Um, uh, but in that, we do want to update on a couple prayer requests we've been praying about. One, uh, Carrie, uh, I've forgotten her new last name, Carrie right. Sampson. Riker. All right, very good. We know her as Carrie Sampson, but her, her, her uh, new married name is uh, Riker. So uh, she came through a procedure fine today. Everything went according to plan. So we're grateful for that good news. Uh, of course, she had open heart surgery again. She'll pray that she'll have a wonderful and a speedy recovery, um, which is a, obviously challenging after open heart at any age. So pray for pray for Miss Carrie. It's good to see Brother Josh and Alyssa here tonight. Any updates on the baby you want to share in front of the whole world? Yes. The plan is that she'll be up from home Saturday, so let's pray that way that, that she'll be able to do that. So grateful that she continues to make good progress, and so praise the Lord for that. A little bit of a setback there Sunday, but she's doing fine uh, now, so we're, or we're improving, so we're, we're grateful for that, that good news. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Of course, the prayer lists are in the back there. If you want to grab one on your way out tonight, you can do that. We'll be praying over these requests throughout the week. We, we obviously want to remember to pray for our nation. And as well, our church family, we are continually grateful that God's protected us from the virus. Let's pray he continues to do so and continues to give wisdom as we take steps uh, forward and back to, to uh, normal uh, attendance and, and uh, our normal drive for growth and all of those things that should accompany uh, church, right? We're, we're seeking to, to bring people in. Um, and to get to know them, not distance from them. That's the, the ultimate goal here, right? So let's be praying that the Lord will allow us to get back to get back to that uh, as soon as, as possible. Pray for wisdom. We don't want to get ahead of the Lord, but we want to have the faith to follow his, his lead. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the blessing that's ours to uh, gather as a church family this evening. We pray, Lord, that, that most of all, that you would meet with us. We are grateful. I'd have a missionary with us tonight. We're thankful for the faithfulness of the Demarest uh, through these decades now, and grateful, Lord, that we've been able to, to uh, cooperate with them 
in the specific uh, field of mission that you've called them to. We pray uh, your blessing on the service tonight as he will uh, give us some update and then uh, challenge us from your word. Help us to be receptive and responsive to your word according to your will. We pray for all of our missionaries around the world as they serve in these challenging times. Lord, we, we see the challenges we're facing and they, they are facing uh, similar challenges and some very extreme. So we pray you give them wisdom and direction. Many, Lord, we know would like to get back to their fields and are unable to do so. And some, Lord, uh, perhaps were supposed to come home uh, during this time and are unable to get home. So we pray you just give peace and direction. Watch over. Again, Lord, we, we thank you for your protection of our church family. We ask that you continue to protect us as well as our missionaries. We uh, thank you that you brought Carrie through her procedure uh, safely today and that the reports are very good. We pray that that would continue. You give her a good healing and a speedy recovery. And Lord, we pray as well uh, for uh, Anna Lynn that you'd uh, watch over her and, and uh, continue to give her strength and uh, healing and uh, Lord, that she would grow healthy and strong. Pray you give the staff their wisdom as they give direction and that they'd be able to bring the baby home very soon. Watch over Brother Josh as, as he continues to travel. I, I know he's got uh, meetings this week and I pray you'll Continue to give him blessing and fruitfulness there. I just watch over them. Again, Lord, we pray your blessings on our church family. Do guide and direct as we continue to take these steps back to, to a normal church function. Uh, Lord, we expect and desire the extraordinary in that uh, you would meet with us. But, Lord, as far as us being able to meet regularly, uh, we pray that that would, would be uh, feasible. Uh, very soon, continue to protect. And, Lord, I pray you protect us as we take this next step this week. And, returning to normal Sunday school classes. I pray that uh, you watch over us, give wisdom, and Lord, we pray that as we meet, the, the meetings and Sunday school hours would be uh, filled with thy spirit, that you would work in our midst and they would be fruitful, that we would uh, grow by your grace. Uh, bless our Sunday school teachers as they get back into the, the routine of teaching. And Lord, I pray you'd watch over them. Thank you for their faithfulness and dedication. Lord, again, now we ask your blessing on the service tonight. We pray your rich blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Brother Jesse. All right, stand and join me again as we go to hymn 185. Jesus paid it all, hymn 185. <laughs>
think I need to correct something. I knew I was going to miss misstate the baby's name, and I did, didn't I? It's, is it Adelin? Is that correct? Yeah. I said Adeline, didn't I? Yes. I'm my own prophet. I told you Sunday I was going to mess that name up often. So anyway, but the Lord knows who she is. So praise the Lord for that. Adeline. Yes. That's twice. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. The grandmothers did not throw tomatoes or anything during the prayer. At least if they did, I didn't, didn't hear them whiz by my head or anything like that. So very good. Brother uh, Jeff Damrist has been our missionary uh, for many, many years. Um, uh, they're currently serving in South Africa. He's been in the continent of Africa for a long time. I guess you'll update us on that when, when you get up here. But, uh, we, were, we had dinner before the service tonight, and uh, I couldn't believe it. He said it was 2016 was the last time he was here. I said, really? It seems like it was just a couple conferences ago. And it was, it was just about four conferences ago. So uh, they are, they're back in what was supposed to be a short time, but of course COVID-19 has adjusted that. And so they may be in a little longer. And if, if he's in a real long time, he's gonna be with us at our missions conference in January. So we'll try to freeze him out one more time. But uh, he is hopeful. And as much as we would love for them to be here for our conference, we're, we're hopeful they're able to get back to the field because that's where, where God has called them and where their heart is. But uh, if, if things get delayed, they'll be, be back here in January with his wife. And I told him tonight at dinner, he, he sent me a text this afternoon and said his wife wasn't going to be able to be here. And so I told him tonight at dinner, that's great. I'm only going to give you half your love offering. <laughs> <laughs> Seems fair. I think that's generous on our part, really, for the most part. He's, his response, typical Jeff Demmer style, oh, so I am getting a love offering. That's good. <laughs> he's, he's, he, knows, uh, he knows how to play the so-called game. It's not a game, though, is it? It's a serious business. We're thankful for their faithfulness to serve the Lord in Africa. So Brother Jeff, you come and give us an update and preach to us. Is my mic on? You guys happy back there? If you don't make the sound man happy, you don't make anybody happy, amen? That's right. Well, it's good to be here to, wow. I won't say anything else. It's good to see all of you here tonight that are here. This is amazing. Yeah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for what he's doing. Amen. And my God's greater than COVID-19. Amen? Amen. Or anything else the devil wants to throw at us. And it's always a joy to be at Bethel Baptist Church. And uh, this is one of my favorite places to be. I'd rather be here than the best jail in West Carrollton, wouldn't you? <laughs> Some of you look like you just got out of jail. Yeah, I see you shaking your head back there. Amen. Well, let me give you a quick update. The preacher said I have 32 minutes. Is that right? That's what you said. Something like that. He said, quarter till, we got to be done. So I will be quick. So you listen quick. And if I go over and you don't want to leave, it's okay. I'll still be here. But anyway, I, it's good to be here. We, were, uh, we should be busy packing suitcases. We were supposed to leave a week from tonight to go back to South Africa. Uh, but God had other plans. But you know, God is in control and he knows what he's doing. We've been praying for years and we've tried to, uh, uh, we've been wanting somebody to come and help us. So let me just give you this update first. Uh, before we left in November, or what, in November, we left in February. This was a short furlough of about four months. We had a family come from Madagascar who had some medical needs and uh, they had come to work with us and actually they're living in our house. And when all this hit, they, they kind of got stuck there. So they're there, and, and it looks like they're going to be with us uh, permanently. The Rackley family from Madagascar, they've been eight years in Madagascar. And uh, for health reasons, they've had to come to South Africa. And uh, God just brought them at the perfect timing. And uh, he's younger than I am. And I'm finding out, brother, that uh, most a lot of people are younger than I am nowadays, the, the older you get. But uh, Brother Rackley's doing a good job. Uh, November, we started a new church in a place called Kwanuswa. That's out in the Zulu township. It's an all Zulu uh, area. And we started with a kids club on Saturdays. We were averaging about 20, 25 kids on Saturday with a kids club. Some of those folks we were bringing to the church we have in Hillcrest, which is a mixture of, uh, of folks, white and black, European and, and Portuguese, and uh, just, it's a mixture. And, uh, but they got to be so many that uh, we thought about getting a bigger vehicle to bring them. 
But God worked it out where we could start a place. They gave us a place out there. So we've been meeting out there on Sunday mornings, averaging about 20 folks on Sunday morning, adults, mainly adults and, ki and some kids. And uh, just before we left in January, we had three adult men get saved. Blessing Elias and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name right now. That's what happens when you start getting old. Anyway, uh, it's a Zulu name. That's why I can't remember it. But uh, uh, these three guys were the first three to get saved. And I was excited because they're men. You know, you, you get kids to come, and, and you get women to come, but to get men to come, and they are excited. Now, of course, all of that is shut down, and we haven't been able to do anything, but uh, we've got a place, and I know that when we get back, because I've been in contact with some of them, they're excited about getting back and getting back in church. So on Sunday morning at 8.30, we have a service out in Kwanuswa. We drive about 20 minutes back into town, and at 11, we have a service at Hillcrest, where we have a mixed congregation. The Lord is blessing there. And, and then at 3 in the afternoon, we have a, a ministry at the nursing home. So by the time Saturday, a Sunday finishes up, we're tired. I, I know what that's like, preacher. you got to preach three times on, uh, on Sunday. But the good thing for me is I can preach the same sermon three times. And when I get to the nursing home, those people get the best one because I've had practice two times. Amen? <laughs> so they really like it. But the Lord's blessing the ministry there, especially with the Rackleys joining us. And uh, in November, uh, or excuse me, December 30th, we received our 12th container of literature and scripture that we've sent to Africa. We've reached over 14 different countries with literature from Bibles and New Testaments, uh, chick tracks. How many know what chick tracks are? You've seen those tracks. They sent us 115,000 chick tracks in four different languages to use in South Africa. And, and, and the good thing was they, didn't, they gave them to us. They said, man, you got a container going, we'll give you some. We had whole Bibles and New Testaments, and, and on, uh, we unloaded that trailer on the 30th. We had a, another missionary and his brother-in-law come down and with their Bible college students to help us. And uh, uh, while they were there, he was telling me, Brother Smith was telling me, he said his son-in-law was in from Kenya. And on the next day, they were going to hold a service. We have a... We have a a melting pot of people. We have a lot of people from the Congo that speak Swahili and French and English. And he said, he said, my son-in-law is getting ready to preach to this group of guys up in this certain town. He said, but uh, they, he's going to preach in Swahili, but they want French Bibles. Guess what we had on the container? French Bibles. You see, God says his word would not return void, but it would accomplish that which he sent it forth to do. So as of January or February, just a few months ago, we have been in Africa for 30 years. And God has blessed and used this old Missouri boy. And you know what? We just need to make ourselves available. But the exciting part is that you've been a part of that for 30 years. Yeah. You see, your, your missions the missions conference to me, that's the most exciting day of the year because it's about missions. And that's what I'm all about. Yeah. But you know, that makes us partners together with him. The Bible says in Corinthians, we then as workers together with him. Now, uh, as soon as this thing opens up, we want to get back. And, and if it opens up soon, how many like to go back with us? South Africa. Nobody. Where? Yep. Okay, I see. Your left or my left? I see one over here. I see one. Where's the other? Well, we'll have to talk about some of them. Go <laughs> I'm not wanting people that you want to send one-way ticket, all right? <laughs> you know what? If you come, we treat you so many different ways, and we feed you so many different things, you'd have to like one of them. <laughs> but you know, uh, we can't all go. Now, some of you can come and visit, and I hope you do soon. Or in fact, if you go ahead of us, you can get things ready for when we get there. But you know, we're all commanded to take the gospel to all the world. And we're commanded to preach the gospel to every creature. And we can't be everywhere at one time, but the way we do it is through missions. Yeah. And when you pray and you give and you go, or you pray and you give so others can go, you know those three guys, Blessing, Elias, and the other guy, I can't remember his name, you had a part in their salvation. Yeah. And, and I really think, preacher, someday I, there's some people going to come to you at, at Bethel Baptist Church and say, thank you for sending missionaries. Because they came... We heard about Jesus and got saved. Yeah. And that's what I want to talk about tonight in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33. If you'd go with me there quickly. Ezekiel 33. 
In Ezekiel, we see uh, Ezekiel's job has just changed. He was a priest for 30 years. Now he's become a prophet. And uh, he, he's prophesied, and it's been prophesied that Jerusalem was going to fall to the Babylonians, and the king would be dethroned, and, and the temple destroyed, and the enemies would triumph, and all of that happened as was prophesied, and God reappoints Ezekiel as, with a new job, as God's watchman. Now, if you understand what a watchman is, we used, when I worked at the factories, we'd have a, a security guard or watchman at night, he'd walk around and punch the clock in certain places, just checking, making sure everything was okay. And Ezekiel's been appointed as a watchman here, and a watchman's job is to do two, two things, to watch and to warn. To watch or to discover the approaches of the enemy and uh, not be blind or asleep on the job, but to be awake and alert when it's his turn to be on duty. He's to watch, and then also he's to warn, to give notice of the approaching enemy uh, and sound the trumpet immediately. Ezekiel chapter 33, if you go there with me, let's read the first seven verses. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So the watchman's job is to warn the people of the enemy coming, to blow the trumpet, and to let them know trouble is on the way. If they hear the trumpet, the Bible says, and they don't take heed, they don't listen, then if something happens to them, he says, the blood is on their own head, or they are guilty themselves. But if they hear the trumpet and they take warning, they'll be saved. But if the watchman sees, them come, sees the enemy come, and he does not blow the trumpet, he does not give the warning, and the people do not know, he says, and people die, he says, their blood will be upon the watchman's hand. Then he says in verse, uh, um, verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Now jump down to verse 11 real quick. Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. You know, the children of Israel, they're always getting themselves in trouble. They repent, they turn to God. Then they let idols come in or idol worship or something come in and, and they turn away from God and get into trouble again and, and sometimes live the wicked life and the wicked lives of those who were trying to overtake them. And God tells Ezekiel here, he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, Ezekiel's job is not to blow the trumpet, so to speak, but his job is to warn them of the problem that is coming if they don't repent. If you notice, the watchman's job is to watch for the enemy. He says to the sinner, thou shalt surely die. And you know, I want us to think of this today or this evening is that you and I are God's watchmen or watch women. We are to be standing in the gap between God and that person who is without Christ. And you're, you know, we, we've had to be creative through all this stuff we're going through. And uh, even in South Africa, we've been using Facebook and, and YouTube and, and we're doing devotions through the week, trying to help and encourage our people because uh, most of our places are still locked down. You, you're not even supposed to leave your house unless you're going to the store or to the doctor. And uh, 
So we, 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 we're a long ways from South Africa from meeting together. So we've had to be creative. And we've had to, we have to be creative even at this time to reach people for Jesus Christ. I mean, you, you walk into a store and you, you got your mask on and you get a tickle in your throat from an allergy. You cough once or twice and uh, people scatter like cockroaches when the lights are turned on. But you know what? We still have a job to do. And we may have to be creative in doing it, but we still need to warn people. You see, you and I are God's watchmen. He says that in 1 Timothy 2.4, God says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God still desires all men to be saved even in the midst of this virus thing that we have. And you know what I found out? There are some people who are a little more interested in spiritual things right now. There are some who are interested in eternal things. This thing has them scared. Uh, I'm, I'm not scared about this virus. Um, I, I got to tell you this, I'm not scared to die. I don't know if you're scared to die or not. I'm not scared to die because I know where I'm going. Yeah, right. I might be scared how I die, <laughs> but I'm not scared to die. Uh, last year in June, about this time, I was in a car wreck. I, I, how many, anybody remember reading about that or hearing about that? We were, I was coming home from our recovery, alcohol addiction, bad habits recovery, and a drunk man hits me. How ironic. <laughs> and uh, uh, traps me in the car, and they have to cut my Toyota Camry. That's the worst thing about it, preacher, that I lost my Camry. That was, that was a sad day in my life. Not that I was hurt or anything. Um, but you know what? I, I got thinking a little about it. eternity there. You know, I, I, I don't think I've ever been in shock before. Anybody here ever been in shock? You know what shock feels like? You don't want to be there. And, and, and I, you know, I thought, you know, is this for a split second, is this it? And I think of somehow what some, some ways that people die. I don't want to die like that, but I know when I die, I know where I'm going. But there are a lot of people who don't. And God says he desires all men to be saved because Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is what? death. They will surely die as, he, as God is talking to and said to Ezekiel here in Ezekiel 33. And it's God's will that we warn the wicked. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter 3.9 But if the soul perish because of his own neglect, he brings guilt upon himself. You know, we're to warn people. I think of a man called Jim. I called him my coffee man. We grow coffee in South Africa, and uh, they grow it right in our area. It's called Asagai coffee. That's the Zulu word for shield. And I like to buy it and bring it back to some of my favorite pastors. Did I give you one yet? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> See what happens when you only get a half loaf off and you don't get coffee. <laughs> So uh, Jim, uh, he, there's this big market, farmer's market we have, and they sell everything, and some of the best food around, and, and, and you can buy it. If, if, if they don't have it, you don't need it. That's just how it is. And Jim, I get my coffee from him, so I went there one day, and, and, and I went looking for Jim, and he went at the coffee stand. I saw him sitting over on a bench in the shade, so I went over and talked to him. I said, how you doing, Jim? He says, not too good. He says, I've got this pain in my leg, and i got to go see the doctor. And, and I said, well, I'll pray for you. And you know what? I'd never taken the opportunity to witness to Jim. And I thought, I, I need to witness to him next time I see him. A few weeks later, I was back up there. And Jim wasn't on the bench. This time he was in a wheelchair. And he said, yeah, this leg's gotten so bad that they think that I've got cancer in my leg. And I said, Jim, I'll pray for you. And if you ever need help getting to the hospital, I, kn I knew he couldn't drive now. I said, let me know if you need a ride to the doctor. He said, well, I'll let you know. And I prayed with him. And I left it at that. I get a call from Jim. Says he they need help getting home from the hospital. A couple of weeks later, I go pick him up, take him home, talk to him, uh, talk to him, ask how he's doing, what the doctor's saying. Says I'm gonna have to have surgery. It, it doesn't look good. And prayed with him, and still didn't witness to him. Jim called me a couple of weeks later. Needed another ride. I wasn't able to take him that time. Something else was already scheduled. Two days later, his brother-in-law called me and told me that Jim died in the hospital. 
and I thought of the missed opportunities. But I didn't sound the trumpet. I don't know if Jim was saved or not. I know I got to preach a good gospel message to about 80 people. But if Jim was lost and he went to hell, then his blood is upon my hands. And I never want that to happen again. You see, if we don't warn them, who will? But if we warn them and they turn to God, their soul is delivered from hell. He that taketh warning, verse 5 says, shall deliver his soul. We had uh, a fellow by the name of Sean in our church. I may have told you about him. I, don't, I can't remember dates too easy when things happen anymore. Sean was working at a, a big pharmacy like CVS or Walgreens. And Sean was a big tall guy. And, and we called him a gentle giant because he was so nice. And, John, and Sean was uh, always helping people. He could get, so he was so tall, he could get stuff off the top shelf. He would help people find things. He's always, always there if you needed him. He was, he was so nice and generous, he'd give the last few coins out of his pocket to help somebody with a ride on the taxi, the transit system, or for food. He was, he was always, he didn't have a car, he walked to work most of the time. And uh, Sean, uh, we got to know him, started inviting him to church. He said, well, I got to work every other Sunday, and I'm, I do go to another church. He said, but I'll come and visit. So I invited him to our recovery program. He started coming on Friday nights, and, and uh, we got to know Sean a little better, and he started coming on a Sunday uh, when he was off work. I said, Sean, when's your next day off? I want to take you for coffee. And we'll go up to this little place and we'll have coffee and a bite to eat so we get to know each other better. So I started talking to Sean there at that little coffee shop at that little table. And uh, we got to know each other a little better and his family and, and uh, found out that he used to go to church a lot and he's attended several churches in our area. It's like here, we, we've got a, in our town of about probably 10,000 people, we've probably got 15 different churches in that little town of every faith, religion, creed, and origin you can think of. So I said, I said to Sean, I said, uh, I asked him, I said, Sean, let me ask you a question. Are you for sure you're going to heaven when you die? And his answer really surprised me because he said, yes, I, I do. I know I'm going for sure. I said, how do you know you're going? He says, because I help people. He says, I help people all, all the time. And Sean did. He was the type of guy that if you needed his shirt, he'd give you the shirt off of his back. So I said to him, Sean, could I show you from the Bible what God says we must do to go to heaven? He said, sure. So I opened my Bible up and I started. Now, I didn't just go to Romans chapter 310 and 323 and 623 and 58. A lot of places the Romans road won't work because they don't even understand what sin really is and where it came from. A lot of times we have to go back to the book of Genesis. And we talk about Adam and Eve and where sin came from and, and, and how sin came upon all men. And, and 45 minutes, an hour later, you get down to a place of decision. So we sat there in that little coffee shop and, and I gave Sean the plan of salvation. And I said, I said to him, Sean, if you die today, are you for sure you go to heaven? I asked him again. He said, no. I said, would you like to be sure? He said, yes. I said, would you like to call upon the Lord to save you? And he said, yes. And right there in that little coffee shop with people around us, we bowed our heads and prayed, and Sean accepted Christ as his Savior. And that excited me because Sean was so excited about the ministry and getting more involved. I knew Sean would probably never be a pastor, but I tell you what, preacher, he's one of those guys you wish you had 10 of in your church because he's always wanting to do something and get something going and and so uh, we were busy. We had uh, we had grown. We had we had a small office area we were using for church. We had grown, and the office next door was open. So we rented that. And we took the wall out between the two rooms and we expanded. We doubled our size. What, what would happen if you had to double your size in one week, preacher? Start small if you do. Amen. <laughs> and uh, so we took the wall out. That was on on Wednesday, and and we got everything cleaned up and set up for Bible study Wednesday night and. Sean went home, and, and I picked him up for Bible study later that night, and, and uh, we had, we had uh, services and things going good, and, and I took him home. I said, I'll see you on Friday. Thursday morning, I got a call from his brother-in-law. He said, 
Sean died in his sleep last night. Said the medical personnel came in. Nothing wrong that they could tell. Foul play. Not, he just died in his sleep. Think he probably had a heart attack. But they said one thing they noticed. He said he had his arm over his chest and he had a smile on his face. You know, I thought, man, this guy, God's going to use this guy. You know, we don't know what God's going to do. Amen. And we don't know how long people have. That's right. That's right. And we need to warn them. And, and I'm glad I warned Sean when God impressed me. You know, you know what we got to do? we got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. He says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. You know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is a person who represents another country and another king or president. Folks, the Bible says we're ambassadors. We represent the king of kings and lord of lords. lords. We, we represent heaven here on earth. And God does not desire that the wicked die in their sins, but they should repent. Amen. So how are they going to know? We're God's watchmen. We're his watchwomen. Now let me ask you a question. I know it's difficult to try to walk up and talk to people now. They'll probably run the other way. But you know what? I've been able to hand out a few tracts to people. I've got, we've got these tracts that were sent over in English that says five things God wants you to know. So I took some of those tracts before we came back from South Africa and I, I put a stateside, my name and stateside address on them so I could hand them out here. And people, I don't think I've had anybody refuse me. I know some people who say that, uh, I don't, does anybody pay your bills by check anymore? Remember when, how many know what a checkbook is? Yeah. A few of us know what a checkbook is. I had I had an aunt. Uh, she when she'd write her utility bills, she'd put a check. She was so mad at the at the, the cost of what her electric bill was. She put a track in with it, mail it back to him. You know, there, we need to be creative how we can witness and talk to people because we need to stand in the gap. We are the only thing between heaven and hell for some people. Somebody said this once. I like this. He says he said uh, or she whoever said it said, you are the only Bible some people will ever read. Yeah. How many of us know who our next door neighbors are? Do we know their names? Do we know what kind of life they have? I mean, they live right next door or across the street. Have we ever, have we ever taking over an apple pie to them. Do people do that anymore? We ought to. The Bible says we need to show ourselves friendly. We need to, we, uh, you know, our culture and everything is changing. And, and, and I've, I've done a little bit of study and research. You know, all culture is not bad. And all traditions aren't bad unless it goes against the word of God. And we have to deal with a lot of that in Africa. But you know what? The culture of the generation today is so different. And sometimes we're going to have to enter into somebody else's culture, their situation to get to know them, to be able to witness to them. But how are we going to witness to them if we don't even know who they are? You know, I found this out. When I ask God to give me somebody to witness to, to share the gospel with, he always does. Let me ask this question, and then I'll turn it back over to the preacher. How many of us know somebody who's lost without Christ? Probably the majority of us. When's the last time we shed any tears over them? When's the last time we went to God and prayed for him? When's the last time we shed some tears and got on our knees and asked God and begged God to save them? When's the last time we asked God, would you open a door, a window of opportunity that... I could say something that would encourage them and get them to thinking about the things of God. You know, I've I've been on I've been on both ends of the spectrum. I've I've been able to lead people to Christ who were just ripe to be led to Christ, 
Others had witnessed and planted and done all the work, and I got to bring in the harvest. I remember a fellow by the name of Saba, a Greek guy. His wife was in our church when we first went to South Africa. And uh, they had been praying for him for seven or eight years. He wouldn't even come to church. Good guy. Upright, honest, integrity, everything, but he didn't want anything to do with church. And I got to meet seven. For some reason, preacher, he liked me. I don't know why. And we just hit it off. And you know all those years of praying for Saba and trying to witness? And I got the joy of leading him to Christ. Today, Saba's in heaven. You know, we don't know who we're going to meet. We don't know their situation. But we need to be praying for folks who are lost. We need to be the gap between them and the Lord so they can know him. Let me encourage you tonight. Make you a list. Start praying for folks who are lost without Christ that you know. Most of us probably have lost family members. My father-in-law, we, we were at my father-in-law's down in Milford, and uh, he's 84 years old. We pray at night together. And this 84-year-old man gets on his knees and weeps and begs God to save his lost family members. I tell you what, I've learned something this last month being down there with him. And that's the kind of person I want to be. Praying for those who are lost and then doing something about it. Standing in the gap. Let's stand together. Our Father, we thank